you're listening to Behind the Wheel on RacingJunk.com. You've read the stories of the drivers and others involved in the sport that we all love. Now hear their stories firsthand via our all-new podcast to find out how their passion for motorsports has made life worth living. <laughs> da, 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 da. I, do, I do root for them, but I know they're going to suck this year. So. You root for who? <laughs> I'm rooting for Tampa Bay this year, but New England's going to suck this year. I know that. You are such a Tom Brady homer. I, I know. My brother calls me bandwagon. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, come on. You, you had all that stuff about New England. How, how many years have we talked about how great New England is, and now it's it's Tampa Bay all the way? Is that what it is? Hey, hey both my boys are on Tampa Bay. I got to go where they go. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> You wouldn't make it as a Bears fan. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No. I mean, I'll still root for New England when they play. No, you just, won't. <laughs> hey, hey, if they would get rid of Cam Newton, I'd be right back to New England. But no, they got to get rid of Cam Newton first. <laughs> well, welcome back to Behind the Wheel on RacingJunk.com. <laughs> Chris and Ellen. And yes, of course, you know, as always, we have to have a little bit of fun, throw some football in there. Yeah. Uh, Ellen's boy, Tom Brady, is finally playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> um, you know what? Good for uh, you know, good for him. Uh, and, and I guess given the current records of both teams, it, it's I take my statements, plural, back <laughs> that, you know, Tom Brady can't carry a team because apparently he's doing just that. So, Well, we didn't play so good against New York the other night, but, you know. Oh, well, <laughs> we yeah. still won. And, and hey, you know what? I'm going to put up one heck of a fight this weekend, too. Oh, yeah. Well, That'll I mean, a heck of a game. my Bears aren't putting up anything. But, you know, it feels like. Hey, they it, did this weekend. I mean, yeah, against the Saints, they did all right. Hey, the Saints are a tough team to beat. Uh, see, the, the Bears, if the Bears were uh, grades in school, they'd be my junior year of high school, which I almost had to repeat. A bunch of Ds and an F um, just across the board because there's just no nothing there. So, in, anyway, Ellen, it, it feels like it has been forever since we've had a chance to, to get together and do a podcast here at Behind the Wheel. It definitely has. I mean, yeah. is it, it's, I don't know. It feels like it's been months, but I guess it's only been a couple of months, but it feels like it's been almost half a year. Yeah. And, I mean, I'll be honest, it's been a definite challenge to find inspiring guests. Um, I've been putting feelers out there, but um, a lot of y'all are ignoring me. But that's okay. I still love you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's COVID, <laughs> but, but you know what? Out of the rough comes a diamond. Um, that's right. Amen. Because I have – when when you told me who today's guest was, my, uh, my, my my eyes and my ears kind of perked up. I was like, oh, really now? Um, for those of you who have listened to the podcast, you know that Ellen has done a great job of lining up people who have great stories to tell that, you know, just have stories full of hope, full of challenge, but, but full of determination. Um, and our guest today is well known on the Racing Junk website, actress, uh, writer, filmmaker, a uh, hot to trot producer uh, and model. Uh, and you probably have seen her Tanya Kay's pinup pole show and classic car cruise in, uh, which, you know, she's got some challenges that she's going to talk to us about. She has a very uh, strong battle that she's going through uh, that I think is hopefully going to be an inspiration, uh, not, not only to women, but just to people in general. Uh, but Ellen tip of the hat for landing Tanya Kay the most dangerous woman in Hollywood is today's guest. How about that? Hey, I'm just grateful she works with us at Racing Tuck. That's the only way I think I was able to get her. <laughs> <laughs> now, come on now. Come on, come on Ellen. It's uh, fear to the mind. You got to pretend like you pulled all the strings and pulled out all the stops to get the guest. Now. Nah, come on. Nah, I, I, I got to give my editor some credit on this one. Uh, Andriana, thank you for making this happen. <laughs> yes, Andriana, thank you. You rock. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She has been a, a saving grace to us many times. So um, hang around because in just a second, we're going to have Tanya Kay joining us right here behind the wheel on racingjunk.com continues attention racers race fans and gearheads if you're looking to buy sell or trade the stuff that stokes your engine then check out racingjunk.com racingjunk.com is the world's number one online racing and performance classifieds where you'll find what you need to rock your ride check us out at racingjunk.com racing and performance classifieds built to go fast 
So welcome back to Behind the Wheel on RacingJunk.com. Uh, Ellen, I got to tell you, I have said for years that I've just been wowed by the guests that you've been able to appropriate and misappropriate during our time here at uh, Behind the Wheel. <laughs> but, but you have gone above and beyond with this one. I mean, talk about you, you swung for the fences and, and, and you nailed it. Not only is she a uh, recurring columnist on RacingJunk.com, but she's also been coined uh, the most dangerous woman in Hollywood. Actress, filmmaker, car enthusiast, and probably owner of one of the most badass vehicles on the planet, uh, and a super badass herself, Tanya Kay. Thank Hi. you for joining us here on Behind the Wheel. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So, you know, tell us a little bit about how you became both a film actress and, you know, how you got started in that. I've, I've seen on your social media the, the old headshots that you found at your parents' place. So it must have gone you know, back at least a couple of years, right? Yeah, um, it's funny that you mentioned that because, you know, senior pictures, I grew up in a farm town in Southern Michigan and there weren't a lot of role models in the entertainment or arts industries for me at that point mm -hmm. in, in the farm town. So um, it came time for senior pictures and, uh, you know, that's an expense for families and for young people. And so we decided to create a senior picture that would also suffice as a headshot <laughs> okay. in my acting and dance career. Back then it was mostly dance, but I did right. act as well. Um, when I was a kid, uh, parents read kids bedtime stories and I didn't just listen to bedtime stories. I acted them out on my bed. <laughs> I, as we all do perform the bedtime story, then I'd choreograph things during the day. As soon as my parents got a VHS like recorder, not, not for the TV, uh, a, like a video camera, a VHS oh, sure. video yeah, yeah, yeah. camera. Mm -hmm. I was making videos, choreographing music videos, news programs, you name it. Right. Um, you had the so bug in you from day one, pretty much. I had the yeah. bug, and my parents uh, enrolled me in dance classes because they caught me dancing so much. They put me in dance classes um, pretty young, and then I started teaching dance pretty young, and I started performing for money um, when I was like 15. So my parents were cool. They would drive me up to Detroit, which was a two and a half hour drive oh, wow. from my farm town. Okay. And this was uh, before I actually had my license, so I couldn't drive myself. And that got me into uh, the professional world of getting to entertain. But otherwise I was doing community theater and all of that. Um, <laughs> it's funny, I graduated valedictorian and I immediately moved out of the house. I was oh, like, wow. gotta get out of here. So, so, so no Chippewa or Mustang in your future, huh? That, that just wasn't in the plans for being, you know, the Southern Michigan area. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, not at that point. Um, I moved away immediately and I got arrested <laughs> and oh, no. I, was, I couldn't fit into society, right? So like I was always doing bad things and I was fired from 13 factory jobs immediately. Oh, wow. And I was in the meantime, I was also taking these long road trips over to Chicago and auditioning for theater productions. And I booked all of them, like they all would hire me. So when I got arrested, I realized like, oh gosh, I'm not a loser. I'm an artist. There's a fine line between these things and you just need a place to express it. If you're an so, artist, you need to have a place to express that and then oh, absolutely and connect with people that way. And Chicago has, has a great tradition of having such great classic and, uh, you know, jazz style uh, performances, especially down there around the underground and the depot yeah. and stuff like that. They had a, they have a great session, but the, the, the being arrested so many times that, that leads me to believe that you might have a little bit of issue with uh, authority maybe. Oh uh, yeah, Pro <laughs> probably you can say that. I swear that runs in the race and death family. So that yes, it does. Issues with authority. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. You know, uh, thanks, 
th- you know, thanks to a little uh, incident with Al Gore and Jaja Gabor, I'm not actually able to vote legally here in the contiguous <laughs> United States. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll actually get to that later. Now, obviously, being able to book all those shows that had to have led to something bigger, like Broadway. Yeah, I um, after Chicago. So I toured out of Chicago. I taught dance. I also um, did, you know, theater in Chicago. And then I moved, I moved to New York and it was exciting. I'm just open to the adventure. I'm all about like new things and starting over and new people. New York was exciting. It matched my energy pretty well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I saw a photograph one time of me on the subway and I, I laughed out loud because I said, how did I go from like this farm town girl to the freakiest chick (laughs) <laughs> on the New York City subway. Well, I mean, that's a big claim. That because you know, I've 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 ridden that subway. That's a huge claim. Not one I really know if you want to take, though, Tanya. <laughs> I had dreadlocks. I was I was like an anime character. I saw then. the blonde dreads though. Was that the same that's the same cool. time period with the blonde dreads? That was New York. Yeah, definitely had them in New York. You looked like one of the original Suicide Punk girls. Yeah, okay, definitely. Cool. Yeah. And I was a fire spinner, and I did all these. Oh, I used to do that. <laughs> oh my god, I used to twirl fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I made a career of it, of course. And in New York, I learned I could do like experimental things really well. So um, I moved away from traditional theater mm-hmm. and more into experimental work and experimental dance companies. And that's when I booked Stomp. Nice. And Stomp was my dream gig. I've been a tap dancer since I was a child. Those are the first classes that my parents enrolled me in. And so I toured with Stomp and we're like the renegades of the theater world. Very experimental. Oh yeah. All percussive, uh, just a lot. I, I laugh after I quit the show um, for physical sake, cause it's hard on the body. I was gonna say that had to be a beating. <laughs> <laughs> very and they don't want to hear it it's very much in the in the cast like everybody <laughs> hurts so don't talk about it you right know? right right um but after i got out of stomp um i re- recognized a definitive lack of uh socially acceptable destruction in my life where in stomp you destroy things it was just part of the job you destroy trash cans and and uh hubcaps and you name it whatever scraps they got from the yard is on stage and you're playing music on it and you literally destroy it and then you get out into society when you don't have that outlet right it's just not socially acceptable to destroy most things. I was going to say, so you, you go from just years of destroying stuff to now you have to be a law abiding citizen. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> it but, was, so, so and be, you know, hopefully you had at least one incident where maybe you're on the side of the road, beating a bunch of garbage cans, cops pulled up and you said, I'm just making music. <laughs> no, right? I didn't do that. You didn't? I didn't own a car because all of those times, this is what's funny. Um, For nine years, I either lived in New York or I was on tour, and I didn't even have keys in my life. I didn't have anything that needed locked up. I didn't maintain a storage space. I didn't maintain a home. I didn't maintain a car. I had nothing. I was very free. Um, And now I have like so many cars. Right. Uh, (laughs) Oh, yeah. We're going to get to the semi here in a minute. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I love that California dreaming. Yeah. you and I need to sit on top of that uh, Great Space Coaster and do some, you know, twirling our fire batons. I don't even know if I, I don't even have a fire baton anymore, but you know, <laughs> hey, I could get one. I have a baton still. <laughs> I would, I would video it. I would make a movie out of it. You know that. Uh, do you know how many people? Giant. Do you know how many people would pay to see that? The only thing is, Ellen, we got to make sure that the liability insurance is up. Yeah. Um, hey, I'm cool. I, I mean, granted, you know, part of my five-year plan was to be laid up with a work-related injury. Just not sure if I want to come out looking like a burn victim. Uh, hey. It's real. <laughs> hey, I've always wanted to be in a remake of Purple Rain. We could just make it different. It could start with a fire and end with a rain. Hey. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, good. <laughs> good idea. I have the chaps that yes, Prince girl. wore. So. Hey, and then I toured for a long hat. time, and I wound up in Vegas performing, and I did many tours. And then I wound up in Los Angeles, where um, theater is is uh, less. People have less interest in theater, right? 
and more interest in film and television. So mm -hmm. entertainment instead of the arts. And you can still use your artistic discipline, but it's wise to figure out how you can um, uh, morph it into something that people will pay for in this uh, market. And it's beautiful. Film and television is is a fun industry. It took me a while to understand, like the connection is different because when you're on stage and you're doing live stuff, you get immediate response from your audience. Right, right. And it feels good as a human being to connect with people that way. Mm -hmm. And then on, in film and television, you don't really get that at yeah. all. You just kind of so, hope for a response. You just kind of hope that they're giving you the reaction that you want, you know? Yeah. yeah, like everybody on set is working, so they're not like wowed. Sometimes you get comments like really neat, good job, like right. great. But your audience, it's mostly social media and I, social media is weird anyway. Mm -hmm. So so people feel very anonymous there and they, they project onto performers sometimes like we don't have feelings and we're not human beings. I don't know. Right. So um, trolls. So, Social media, I have to, mm -hmm. you know, take you take with a grain of salt. It's just not the same as performing on stage. So out here, I did create uh, Tanya Kay's Pinup Pole Show, which is a morph between classic cars and stage photography, pinup photography, and uh, retro styling. You know, we have how did that all come about? Because I mean, I, you had to have been a model along the way as well. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Like I did some commercial modeling and I did a lot of uh, form and figure modeling. Being a dancer, I mm -hmm. did form and figure modeling in Chicago for art classes and artists a lot. Um, and I was never passionate about modeling. It was just an extra way that I could make money in a sure. performing arts career. But then I did get into classic cars. Um, <laughs> I've always been into cars, but I... I got my first classic car and I just realized like what a cool community this is. Oh, absolutely. And my, my dedication to it was immediate and I wanted to create events and things. And that's really what got me into modeling because when I saw the beauty, what I perceive as mechanical beauty in these classic cars and the way people maintain them, it, some of them are, perfect some of them are in process some of them are just junky but who cares like it's just beautiful to me so the beauty of the classic cars with modeling now i'm passionate about modeling so okay so i, I totally thought it would have been the other way around so the classic cars got you wanting to do more modeling instead of vice versa yeah i'd say when i started the show um i I had done modeling. Mm -hmm. I, I modeled for dance magazines or those classes or whatever, but it was fun. It's good to get photos, you know? That's sure. Fun. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't passionate about it, but it was the cars that made me passionate about it and made me really endeavor to learn about the photography aspect, lighting, um, angles for cars, angles for human beings, uh, the styling, the, the clothing that we wear, the yeah. way the women do their hair. Uh, it's, it's just fun. I'm the producer of the photo shoots too. So right. that's, that's why I care about all the aspects of what goes into a really beautiful photo. So, and one of the things, you know, that uh, we, we probably need to catch people up on um, <clears throat> is what is the year and the make and model of the classic car that you have? Oh, I have a 1965 Buick Riviera. It's bright purple and I call it the Grape Space Coaster. <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite color. It's it is so color. freaking awesome. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and we've got, a, if, I don't know, some people are of similar generation as me. Uh, did you ever see a television show with uh, called The Electric Company? Electric yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great yeah. Ace yeah. Coaster. Yeah, Get absolutely. Oh, yeah. So oh, they have this like roller coaster that went to outer space in this kid's show. And uh, I think that's totally appropriate to call my car the Grape Space Coaster. Absolutely. Like, like an outer space roller coaster. I don't know. It's that much fun. And I decorated it with disco balls and it, 
interior LED lighting. I was going to so, ask. I didn't, I, I didn't see the disco ball. I was going to ask if you had one. Of them. If not, there needs to be one on the rear view mirror. Absolutely. Uh, there's one on the rear view mirror. And, you know, out here in California, everybody has the dingle balls, you know? Oh, oh yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my dingle balls are disco balls. Oh, that That's is awesome. awesome. <laughs> is that what they're called, dingle balls? I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah, or you yeah. call them, on trucks, they call them truck balls. My husband used to have some, and his actually got stolen while he was at work. <gasps> Somebody no, actually got geez. in there and took them out. Let me tell you what, that's that, dedication. That, they cut him off the back of his truck. They cut him off the back of his truck. Oh, wow. Unacceptable. unacceptable. That's absolutely unacceptable. He was you know, so upset. <laughs> I wanted to get a key and, and open up the mind of Tanya Kay and go into it for just a minute to find yeah. out how you came up with the whole burlesque pinup stuff and the classic car tie-ins. I mean, I, I have been there that night when, when you said, oh, I got an idea. <laughs> well, you know, know right? it's like everything came together. Um, but I was, I was in love with cars since I was a child. My parents, I grew up in a car household and my parents had like an early 70s, like 72 Stingray, 69 Goat, and an early 70s Harley Davidson. I thought they were the oh. funnest things in the world. I also liked our late 70s a Pontiac Grand Prix. Oh, I heck yeah. For some reason, oh, I, I had loved one of that car. Yeah, absolutely. That was my first car. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're so boat. They're like big boats and yeah, plenty yeah. of room. Super I had slick. the hardest time driving that thing straight because it was huge and it would shake if you got it up to 60 miles. Wow. Everybody <laughs> had the hardest time driving those things. It was like taking a freaking <laughs> battleship onto the highway. Exactly. <laughs> I felt like I was driving like half tank, half boat. <laughs> See, and Tanya, this will give you a good snapshot of, of me as, as a kid. But one of the first cars I had, because I just thought it was cool, and I thought I was just that style of a pimp. I had a 64 Cadillac L-Day barge. Um, you could <laughs> literally lay completely sprawled out in between the front and the back seat. You couldn't turn it around in six lanes of traffic, but it was uh, bright red with the white leather interior. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hit everything with that car. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Everything. So, so you know, it's, it's good to know that the three of us are fans of the uh, big mobiles. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then when I did first get, you know, I went on tour for so long and I was a dancer. I'm a professional in the arts career. Um, I, I, I uh, the first car that I actually got was a diesel engine and I converted it. I, then I got really into um, alternative fuels. So I was converting mm -hmm. cars and I converted four automobiles. <laughs> now you were working on these yourself? Uh, yeah, you kind of have to in that wow. world, the waste vegetable oil world. Yeah. Um, begrudgingly, I learned a lot because it's, uh, it's a lot of research and development. There's no auto industry that's creating mm -hmm alternative fuel vehicles at that time, right. especially, but for waste vegetable oils. So you, you do it and you figure it out as you go. And the, and the problems that you have are really unprecedented. It's not like typical problems with a car. Right. Like uh, I had to take uh, five gallons of sludge out of my fuel tank. Like oh. the car wouldn't start. And this Hi. is this is a mystery. So you get back to the fuel tank and I guess um, cooking oil, if, if it's not filtered well enough and when you apply heat, if there's bacteria in it, it kind of grows an algae bloom. Oh. And so it's sludge. It's like this algae sludge. That sounds a lot prettier than it actually is. <laughs> and I thought, no, how does a girl who is an actress, a pinup girl, <clears throat> a, 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 somebody who is artistic like me, how do you go from that to working on or finding out about alternative fuels and working on cars? Because that's and, one thing. And growing algae blooms. And growing algae blooms. Like, I, I still can't work on a car to this day. I wish I could. I've tried. But. <laughs> well, I'm just, to, you know, I love learning new things. So that, that helps. I really love learning. And my mind loves learning. And um, I'm an environmentalist, strangely, I am. Uh, I still drive a 65 Buick Riviera, but it's not my daily driver, just so you know. My EV, I have a BMW i3 as my daily driver. Mm, and that's, cool. that's super fun as well in a totally different way. Um, 
So like I'm an environmentalist, I've been vegan for 27 years. Uh, and, and I hadn't, I hadn't had a car. So I was just like, let's have a new adventure and figure out how to do something brand new. And it was fun. It was fun for many years. Uh, it became tedious uh, after many cars and many years. It became tedious and that's when I started looking for a fun car and that's when I found the Buick. Um, but uh, to answer your question, going back <laughs> a long way, that's I was okay. already a dancer. I was already a professional performing artist. I had gotten into pole dance, which is another uh, specialty kind of experimental movement. Oh, me time. too. <laughs> and, uh, Nobody wants to picture that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and I was performing burlesque. I've been a burlesque performer for a major part of my income uh, for a while now in LA specifically, but now I'm touring. Well, not now during the pandemic, but I'm, right. I'm a touring burlesque artist as well. And so I wanted to combine classic cars uh, with pole dance specifically. And I saw an opportunity in pole dance because especially that time, this was six years ago, uh, pole dance was only being seen either at strip clubs or at by aerialists. So there was this huge gap of society that either, when you thought of pole dance, you either st thought of strip clubs or you thought of aerialists. Right, and right. I wanted to offer some really fun, digestible, uh, celebratory way for people to appreciate the athleticism, the beauty, and the sensuality of pole dance in a mainstream setting. So I put it together. I was like, okay, that's going to be pinup pole show because how can I combine these two things? If pole dance has a throwback retro vintage theme, and then I can throw my car show before the show, before the stage show, and that's how it all came together. Because pole dance and cars don't you don't naturally match, but if pole dance is vintage pinup style and the cars involve pinup girls, then I can put them together and everybody loves it. They That's get why I thought, up. Yes. They get, it's, it's the audience that has become the show. They yes. bring their cars, they bring yeah. their dates, their husbands, their wives. They, they get dressed up. They treat themselves out to a really nice, fun, evening of like five hours of entertainment <laughs> that's why i think it's, it's such a unique and beautiful thing i mean you picked a good decade 55 and 65 with the hair the style the dress the whole night you know and the vehicles and i mean it's just you can't not look at it and not smile i mean it's, yeah. just, it's, it's just fun it's just fun and i i really like it like you asked me about modeling and when and did i get passionate about it i got passionate about it with this show that i created um and one of the reasons that I love pinup modeling specifically with classic cars is because of the fun aspect. Everything retro, and at least the way I'm doing it, at least, you know, the pinup pole show style is uh, burlesque can be, burlesque can be a, a wide variety of performance art. It can be down and dirty. It can be cheeky and fun. It can be satire and comedic, but uh, pinup, is always cheeky and just the fun part. And so it's, it's sensual, but it's fun. And I like that modeling so much. Instead of going out and being like, I don't know, as models, you have motivation in your mind and, and it dictates what poses you choose, right? So right. you can do a pose, you know, like super sexy pose, like, video ho pose and put on a, a really fun 1950s style dress and smile your way through it and it becomes less quote unquote dirty and more just fun so we get to be women celebrating our sensuality as i th i find it empowering honestly absolutely I, I love it i've actually always wanted to learn how to pole dance so I don't know if my clumsy self can do it. I do Zumba, but I have never tried pole dancing. <laughs> well, fire spinner, I mean, you're experimental too, so you could definitely yeah. go over to pole dance, and there's no goal. You don't have to be at a certain level or whatever. You just keep building strength because it, it really is a strength. Athletic, it's an athletic thing. It's the upper body, you know. 
Chris, couldn't you just see me hit my head though, trying to pull that? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, that's that's the whole reason why I walk funny now is because I tried it a couple of times, and you know, once you've had six hip replacement surgeries, it's kind of, you know. And and you see you've seen how huge my head is. The the, the yeah. balance and weight mechanisms required for a standard human body, it doesn't apply. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah. I gotta tell you, weirdest injury, pole dancing. I was I was drunk, I admit it. And <laughs> I was pole dancing and I thought I was doing this really great move and I threw myself off the pole backwards and woke up on the ground. I knocked myself out. Wow. I had amnesia for three weeks. From that smokes, injury. <laughs> so pole dance yes take care of your head <laughs> oh my god so how did you go from the idea of combining pole dancing and classic cars into finding racing junk and starting the the columns that you have oh well racing junk i mean I, it's a cool it's a cool community and cool yeah. network uh, because everybody loves cars and I love cars and car enthusiasts are just the coolest people, whether it's race cars or building cars or sports cars, luxury cars, I don't care, supercars, you name it, classic cars, custom cars, you name it. I, I love cars too. So I, I like the racing junk vibe. It's got a lot of DIYers on there. You can feel it. They're at home during the pandemic working on their cars and their garage. It's a good it's a good vibe. Um, and the team that actually runs Racing Junk are cool. And Andriana contacted me and she was familiar with my photography that I've produced with my show. And she's like, cool. I think our readers would really enjoy this. And mm -hmm. I checked out the pre-existing column there, of course. And guess who's, who's the main writer at that time? Mitzi Valenzuela. And Mitzi and Company. Oh yeah, love Mitzi. She's just yeah. famous to me, as far as I'm concerned. She comes to our show. Um, we've worked with her many times, and it's always an honor. She does such amazing pinup and classic car photography. So when I saw that Racing Junk had Mitzi, I was like, Oh yeah, that's that's all the reputation you need to say. Like that's amazing. Let 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 me at it. Let me let me share our photography as well with this cool community. That's cool. And speaking of that, you recently commented on an article that I wrote about breast cancer awareness. And of course, we've had a couple people um, or a couple women on the show in the past um, who have fought and won their battle against breast cancer. And you just mentioned that you are currently battling or going through this battle during the pandemic. Can you mention, talk a little bit about that? Since yes, technically, Breast Cancer Awareness Month was October. We're a little bit late. But hey, breast cancer awareness should be all year round. Right. Yeah, one out of eight women get it. Um, so you're likely to, I mean, not likely, but there is a, a high chance that every woman could get this, you know, you could get it, um, your mother could get it, your daughter could get it, um, and your friend could get it, or you could know somebody who dies of it. And that's what we're trying to do is not die of it. So early detection is obviously the, the most important thing. Um, I was diagnosed during the pandemic, which is a really unique situation. It was kind of alarming at first. Uh, well, it's still alarming. It's not fun to have cancer, no matter what. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the hospitals were overrun with COVID cases. So they shut down uh, hospitals. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do surgeries. Um, two and a half months out here in LA that nobody, no doctor, I got my diagnosis and then nobody would see me in person for two and a half what? Absolutely ridiculous. pretty crazy but in retrospect i do look back and i i have a, a really cool surgical oncologist and the whole time she was saying things like you know I, she was almost apologizing like i'm so sorry that you're going through this right now um but we might find out in the future like you are you are a pioneer of how we're treating breast cancer your type of breast cancer by the way there's over 40 types of breast cancer so nobody can say what anybody else should or shouldn't do right um but she said you know you're a pioneer in your type of breast cancer that you're doing it <laughs> a way that we don't advise but we don't have a choice and we might find out in the future that we've been over treating certain types and that was just such a kind kind of 
uh, optimistic, I don't know, it's hard to say optimistic, but an optimistic approach, kind of a renegade approach, it matches my mind. Um, and now I can look back and I can say, actually, thank goodness I had that two and a half months because uh, if, I, if I had been diagnosed at any other time, that I would have been rushed, literally rushed, like in two weeks, I would have been rushed through a double amputation Mm -hmm. and uh, put in radiation mm -hmm. and potentially chemotherapy as well. <clears throat> and no one was doing that. So I didn't have the option. And instead I had the option to research myself into a frenzy. And uh, oh, wow. I've learned so much. And now eight months after diagnosis, I ha kind of have assembled what's right for me. It's a hodgepodge of a little bit of standard care, a lot of integrative care, some alternative care and complementary care. And I would, I look back and I think, if I had been diagnosed outside of quarantine, yes, it sucks. But if I had been diagnosed outside of quarantine, I wouldn't have had that option. I would have already been through just the standard way. And that's not right for everybody. So uh, yeah, so I've created my own <laughs> Uh, way and I'm on it, and I got a partial remission status recently. Oh, that's great. Awesome, Yay. that's beautiful. Congratulations! Yeah, thank you. It's a slower process because we're not just cutting it out immediately, but right. um, but yeah, so there's I think the hardest part, uh, maybe f just for me, but I, I would expect that the, it would be hard for any woman is the mental part because, yeah, right. I'm young and he, you're always too young to hear that yeah. you have a life-threatening disease. Yeah. Um, and nobody should be thinking about living and dying, you know, but it makes you a, a stronger person, but it's hard on your mental. So the first doctor I contacted when I got my diagnosis was a psychologist and I would highly recommend it to anyone. That's, I was gonna say that's very smart, yeah. Yeah, yeah I knew that, <laughs> that this was big. And my husband is an amazing human being and he's really stepped up to the plate and really shown his true colors and how he's going to be there for me through whatever. That's awesome. Um, but uh, I didn't want to, I don't know if burden is the right word, but oh, no. yeah. I, know how you I do use him. We do talk and he's there. I swear for women, we women, we do that. We're like, oh, we're going to be a burden on our men. Yeah, see, and it's and it's and it's never considered that at all. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's one of the things where you you never want anybody to have to go through it. And when you hear the stories, your heart goes out to the people who are, who are given those stories. But for the loved ones, you you never hear them talking about how oh this was a burden, this was you know X Y and Z. It's it's just not how it is. Yeah, and so I I personally feel like the psychologist was my effort to. To, you know, take a little bit <laughs> right. of the heaviness. Take the out, edge off. <laughs> out of the relationship. Yeah. yeah. But it's still heavy. Don't get me wrong. But. Oh, sure. You know, and that was the thing I was going to get to was I spoke with a lot of people who, you know, both been diagnosed, going through the process, you know, mm -hmm. gone through remission. And I ask them because they're artists and you strike me as a pure artist. And I say, you know, how, how has it affected your art? Some of them say, oh, you know, I, I find myself. I get in and I just get more driven. I'm more focused. And some of them say, you know what? Uh, until I battle this, until I fight it, I just don't have the same drive that I had before. Yeah. I mean, add the pandemic onto this and there's thousands of women that are in the same situation as me. So oh, absolutely. women who are diagnosed with breast cancer are not in the same situation, but there are thousands. Right. And um, the pandemic, it, it has made it hard uh, to maintain another thing that I think is really important for anybody battling a life-threatening illness or any illness is um, optimism, like something to look forward to. And some people have families and they say, I'm doing it for my kids or artists. Mm -hmm. They might, you know, I, I've got this job next year and I really want to be ready to go for this job. But the pandemic has also put like a heavy weight on especially artists who yeah. are unemployed until people get it together and, and squash these numbers. Oh. So, um, you know, there's not a lot to look forward to um, professionally at this moment. And so you kind of got to fabricate 
like things to look forward to because it is important. That's the opt some sort of optimism or hope uh, towards something is imperative. I feel. Yeah, to absolutely. Healing. And yeah. Having yeah, hope and a roadmap is like exactly. the best. Yeah, that, that's the best thing because it's it's the same for us. Now, now luckily, the, the business that I'm in, um, the the pandemic affected us in a positive way. Um, yeah, you know, I I work for Camping World. I'm one of our spokesmen, and uh, you know, people just have gone crazy finding RVs. You know, going out and you know camping, doing all that and the other thing. But it, all my friends from broadcasting and you know television and, and music and all this that and the other thing, it's I hate the boat that they're in, and the only thing I can give them is hope. And I think during this time, during this pandemic, what people are going through, that's the best we, best we can do. Look, it's got to end at some point. Mm -hmm. There's, there's some light in the tunnel. You got to make the light, you yeah. know, and, and for you, your talent and your ability and everything you're able to do is your light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. I don't know how to do anything else. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, this is your way to inspire the women. I mean, you know, we talk about, hope and that kind of thing that's why I put out the book that I wrote called a comeback because we've had a lot of stories on here um where people have um kind of gone through life-threatening things um you know or career-altering things um way before the pandemic and they've all come through it and they're doing something you know based on what happened to them to help other people I mean she mentioned alternative therapies Tommy Johnson senior who is the father of the drag racer Tommy Johnson Jr. Um, he went through cancer, and you know the doctors gave him six months to live. And this was Chris. Do you remember it was five? No, this was several years ago. Fifteen years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say at least fifteen. Anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, and he stopped doing the chemo. He stopped doing the radiation because he had a different form of cancer. But he went to Mexico, found an alternative treatment, and um, actually some teas and stuff that he drank and he is now 100 percent cancer free and has been for like 15 years i need to hear that so, i need to yeah. hear that yeah yeah you know uh i just crossed my mind another awkward thing as a performer as a like a public figure going through cancer whenever it is whether it's the pandemic or not um one of the hardest parts for me is i maintain an online presence through social media Mm -hmm. that is largely, you know, self-promotion. It helps me get more jobs. That's just how it is in the performing arts. Sure. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, as yeah. an actor, a filmmaker, and a dancer and producer. And mm -hmm. so I really had to consider, like, how much of my cancer journey is going online <laughs> because right. the people who follow me give me work. Right. And whether you like it or not, this is for me. Everybody has a right. different way that they sure. do it. Right. And sure. There is no wrong way. But for me, <laughs> right. um, I'm hesitant to start putting my cancer journey on my social medias because the people who hire me follow me. And there's this thing that happens in their minds. They kind of count you out if you're sick. That's so they isn't, they that, isn't that well. sad, though? Isn't that sad that the state of just social media in general has made us get that perception because it happens. Isn't that sad? I think yeah. it's better if it could be, if we have the honesty of, Hey, this has happened to me, but look what's come from it. Cause I think that inspires people more. Right. It's weird yeah. because the public figures, their business is their, their self themselves. Yeah. yeah. So it, it makes sense. Like, on my pinup poll show, social medias, of course I wouldn't talk about cancer, right? Right. Because right. it's a business. It's a, it's a company. It's a business. I, it's not appropriate to talk about personal stuff at, through my business. Sure. But mine, it's harder to see the line because right. I am my business. And so I made the choice to not uh, talk or talk much about it at all on social mm -hmm. media. I don't I don't need social media support, I guess. I don't right. know. Yeah, exactly. But I, I did create a safe place for me, and that's my Patreon page. So I rectified that by allowing myself one online outlet where people could come support me as patrons. Mm -hmm. And that would show me I felt 
that they were invested in me more than just as a content producer, as, as an entertainer. Sure. Yeah. So that's where I do express myself. And it's nice to have that outlet. That was a, that was a smart move for me as a public figure was to draw the line, know where I was going to draw the line. Right. See that, see, and that just infuriates me because yeah. uh, Mike Tyson had a great line about social media uh, a little while back that said uh, social media and you people not being able to feel the repercussions of their actions uh, has, has really made people feel invincible. And his line was, you know, we need to go back to the days when you said something stupid to somebody, you got punched in the face. Exactly. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 such a, it's such a violent statement, but at the same time, social media has given people this sense of invulnerability to say what they know is in, pro, you know, it's not correct and it's, it's mean, but they get away with it. Yeah. And these are the after effects of that. I think yeah. a lot of times what I'm watching now, um, the LA, the riots in oh, June yeah. happened at my house in yeah. Los Angeles. Oh, wow. oh fun. And oh, wow. the Lakers win and <laughs> mm -hmm. we have celebration riots and the Dodgers win and we have celebrate at my house. I don't know why people come to my house. Well, God, it's, it's the car and the dancing. They, they want to see both. <laughs> I mean, my car doesn't live here. I mean, I'm in yeah, LA. I have to have an off site that. garage. Yeah, yeah right, girl. I'd hide that thing too. Don't let them get a hold of that. Oh, but Lord. I do think after seeing, witnessing so much violence um, in front of my building this summer, uh, I kind of think social media, it, in, it, to tag on to what you were saying, social media incites violence in some cases because so people wild. don't feel the repercussions of their actions, because they're sitting somewhere states away yeah. making comments about whether somebody should or shouldn't burn and steal, that it creates a situation where there are millions of people that are being affected by that type of social media um, interaction. And it is right. dangerous. It They've can, gotten way too comfortable without paying consequences. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, that's sorry. That's 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 kind of my soapbox for that one. But um, <laughs> you 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 just mentioned something that, that caught my attention. You keep uh, the Grape Space Coaster off site. Yeah. Um, obviously, don't mention where, but uh, you've gone through a number of vehicles throughout your life. Tell me about the semi. I know you've had the three diesels, and you got the Grape Space Coaster. But I want to know about this semi. How? What? Oh. Where? Why? Well, um, in Los Angeles, I own a uh, company called Solid Hollywood, and it's an equipment rental for major motion pictures. Oh, right and on. These are our work trucks. So I've owned two big old freight trucks decked out with, <laughs> with uh, kitchens inside, essentially, like the best 7-Eleven you'd ever hope for. Oh. And, and big, big movies. Slurpee machine big in there, too, or no? Is what? Slurpy machine in there too, or no? Yep. Just in. Oh. Got, that. Got it. <laughs> I know where I'm going when I come to California. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. And another company I have like a work van for. Um, and in my household, there's two classic cars and two dailies as well. So it's been fun. Before that, I was into alternative fuel vehicles. So Right. Two uh, classic cars. Yeah, my lover has a 240Z, a Datsun. Oh. Wow. 73, cool. yeah. Yes. Oh, I <laughs> love those. Let me tell you what, they, those, those, those big front noses on those things were so yeah. awesome. My best yeah. buddy in the Army had one. We used to take it out all the time when I was stationed down in Texas. I used to love those Zs, man. Yeah, and, and it's so funny because imagine a 240Z and a Buick Riviera. <laughs> like that's our household so one of them zips around and you know right. goes through the angeles crest with ease and and delights and the others like super cruiser yep. <laughs> get me on the highway and i'll blow it away <laughs> so if those two cars had a baby would it be a miata <laughs> oh i, love I don't it. know is that, or, or are That's we looking, or, or would it go the complete opposite direction and you're looking at like a 74 citation? Is that? No, uh, what is it with you that citation, citation Chris? Uh, oh, Chris had a citation. He talks about it all the time. <laughs> love that thing. Do not run into the back of it. We'd all die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
they sound completely different. They drive completely different, but it doesn't stop us. I mean, we have a, a ton of fun going out cruising together. So if you had yeah, cool. any words of wisdom that you could give, and this, this question is going to be two part. Number one, if you had anybody who's maybe looking to get into acting, looking to get into modeling, looking to get into classic cars, looking to get into what you do, what advice would you give them given the road that you've traveled to get where you are? To combine all three of those things, like Los Angeles. Or Angel individually. Yeah, or individually. Yeah. Individually. Well, regarding acting and, well, if you want to combine all three of those things, like LA is a great place to do it because the weather, the car culture out in Southern California is massive just based on our weather. So we have a year round fun time with cars. There's no snow, there's, it's great. Um, so, and if you're into acting and you like film and television, this is also a great place to do it. I, I found, because I grew up in a farm town, that there are more opportunities, the more human beings that live in the mm -hmm. place. So I found that I had to be at least in somewhat big city to make a living doing this. But there's so many different ways to do it. You don't have to just dream of being on television shows that are produced in a big city. Right. Um, if you want to be an actor, there's repertory okay. theater, there's community theaters, there's, you can, heck, this summer during the pandemic, um, LA is super shut down, still super shut down. Um, so we couldn't get together and have a set situation. We couldn't make a movie. So I just devised a way and directed a film that was done completely in quarantine. So the actors, the director, the producer, the cinematographer never saw each other in person. Oh, wow. Very That's a lot of people doing that now. There's yeah. a lot yeah. of people doing it and there's, and it's fun and it's exciting. And I'd say now, especially having done that, I think anybody could make a movie wherever they're from, mm. you know, just decide where your position is in the industry and go for it. You don't have to live in a big city nowadays, but there are more opportunities. Now, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. oh no, 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 go ahead, Ellen, go ahead. I was going to say, here she's talking about doing online films and things like that. I would honestly love to see something where, you know, Tanya was talking about her battle and kind of keeping it private on social media a little bit. What if somebody were to create a autobiography type film where it has people who have battled things like breast cancer and, you know, colon cancer like with Tommy and, and all forms of anything that has brought them down. Like we could have Shane on there where, you know, Shane drove race cars and he broke his neck and he's paralyzed from the neck down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, did something amazing with it. If you had all these people that could say, hey, your life's not over. You know, yes, the pandemic hit or, you know. Right. But look what came out of it. You know, we could do a film from home. We could, you know, people are producing music videos from home. Um, you know, what if something like that? I mean, I could see Tanya doing something like that. And, oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, even, yeah. Even, even women that may have been for instance, the last dancers and have broken a leg or a hip or a, you know, or become paralyzed. I've actually seen a woman who um, did some form of dancing, but she was paralyzed. And um, she did it by the wheelchair and all that. And she had, you know, like lights over the wheelchair and all this stuff. And it was, it was hmm. really cool. I mean, I don't know what she called, I can't remember what she called it, but it was really, really cool. So that's going to be a film idea. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> You are an artist. You have a lot of good ideas. Listen to Ellen doing a hard pitch. You know, the next thing will be in your email is a script. Oh, great. No, I, I wouldn't know how to write. I just think that would be, and I think Tanya could just be like that first story to be like, okay, yes, I'm going through this, but look how beautiful it is to come through this and have something better out of it. See, and, oh, yeah. and, and my idea is... Know. You know, follow me down the rabbit hole on this. Here's, here, here's my idea. <laughs> All right. We take Will Smith. We put him in a post-apocalyptic world where he's the only one alive. Oh, God. Did they do this already? <laughs> and there's zombies. And he has a pet dog with him. Legend. And yeah, didn't they do this movie already? <laughs> it was wow, terrible. It's, sounds like a I, – I like that title. It's, you know, we'll, we'll put it down there as working. But, you know, if you think about it, 
What a great concept for a movie. I just, I just, Relevant, I, I, I just haven't found the right place to pitch it yet. I know it's out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> like on Netflix. Yeah. Or yeah, we take right, a classic car or we take a classic car that's possessed. That and, it, <laughs> and, it and it attacks people. I mean, boom, we got so many great ideas. Now, um, <laughs> Tanya, you know, one of the things that I, that I love. <laughs> yeah, Tanya, one of the things that I loved about your biography was the description of when you bought the Grape Space Coaster. Could, yeah. could you just kind of give us a quick little, uh, you know, tell 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 on that real quick about how you came along buying it and how many owners it had? Uh, yeah, so I was uh, <laughs> seeking a fun car after my waste vegetable oil research and development years. And the Buick, I was actually looking for a 73, like a boat tail. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because I saw those and I was like, oh, those are so cool. Yeah, the big Batmans. Yeah. yeah, like a Batman car. And I came across the 65, this 65. And it was purple. I've had it repainted, but it was purple when it came to me. And I bid on it. This is on eBay. And it lived in Ohio and I bid on it and I didn't make the reserve. I didn't know what the reserve was. And I was like, no, I must have this car. So I called the owner and offered well over what I had bid. And he went silent on the phone. <laughs> and then his wife gets on and she says, I'm sorry, my husband's a little choked up. I don't think he expected a girl to be buying his car. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> wow. Hello, stereotype. <laughs> and he was a Buick guy. He had drag raced it um, before me. And so he was into Buicks. This car specifically was the one that his dad, he grew up, his dad had. So, um, and this was during the recession. So, you know, a lot of people were offloading their spare cars or their spare parts or whatever. And uh, that's beautiful. I scored mm -hmm. and he put it on a shipping truck, on a, a car truck, whatever the car transport. Oh, the flatbeds. Mm -hmm. And it came out, I think it took two weeks. And by the time it got to me, it was on the top. So that's good but it was so dirty and it, it did not look like what I thought I had bought. And it, I couldn't, I couldn't, the brakes were horrible. I couldn't make the thing break. I could the doors <laughs> kept flying open while I'm driving down Hollywood Boulevard. It was comedic. I was like, I made a huge mistake. Um, but then I got into, you know, classic cars and, and pretty quick we, we put it back together and, and I learned a lot and I did a partial restoration recently and yeah, all the documentation, this is a car is a cool car because mm -hmm. all the documentation from the first owner came with it. That's so, so cool. And I got to look through and who was the first owner, uh, Harold Wyatt and Harold Wyatt owned a Buick dealership. So I like to think that this was his favorite car off of mm -hmm. his own lot and that Buick dealership, was two miles west of where I lived. So I brought this car all the way back from Ohio wow. to home. It literally grew up here, exactly where I brought it. That is so cool. It's pretty cool. Pretty that cool. Is. Only been four legitimate owners before me. Right. And, and because of all the documentation that came with it, it's very exciting. I can follow kind of, you can piece together like the history that this mm -hmm. car had um, per its owners and it's fun. And I hope that now it's the, the digital age. So I'm like, do I save all my digital receipts like the other owners did? Heck so yeah. when I pass this car on to the next owner that they'll be able to appreciate it. Absolutely. I don't know. Yeah, ab yeah <laughs> absolutely. It because of that. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, th those cars will go on forever. What, what is one takeaway that you learned, like, like maybe a hard lesson that you learned during the purchase and restoration process? Oh, I would definitely put it in for, I mean, you can buy a car that's pretty good to go, you know, pretty nice mm -hmm. for more money. Or you can buy a car that needs more work for less money. 
And I bought a car that needed more work for less money. And maybe I would do it differently. Maybe I would spend more money up front this next time. Uh, but something I did learn, if you're going to go that direction, we who buy the cars for less money are trying to save money. And then we just do one little repair and then one repair here as we save up our cash. And, and then the first repair goes bad. So you redo oh, yeah. the first repair and essentially you just spend a lot of money on the same repair <laughs> and you never have a finished car. So if I were to do it again, buying a car for less money that needed more work, I would just go for the restoration right away. I would fix it if I could, you know, right, financially. Right. And now is not that time, so I wouldn't. But if, if, if I could, I would just put it into restoration and have a finished car that was fun to drive sooner. Wow. Let me okay, tell you, that's just... just a, of course, that's just a, a, another idea for a, a movie, like just a movie on, like, I would be on all these cars. <laughs> <laughs> actress restoration so cool. <laughs> yeah yeah i have a scripted idea you know that yeah. i have um it always involves cars like if if it's my idea it's got cars and girls cars and yep. girls yep. Hey, oh, and that would be awesome who doesn't love that i mean seriously who doesn't love that i love it right i love it i mean you know I'd what the whole time I'm sitting here listening to Tanya talk, I just keep thinking of all the stuff that she's been through, <laughs> all the things that she's tackled and accomplished, you know, and even going through the battle that you're going through now. If, if you had some words of wisdom or words of inspiration to, you know, other women who are not only going through what you're going through, but maybe have a friend who's going through it, what words of wisdom would you give them? I would just be there for them. I don't, I don't think I'm wise. I mean, we're, people say we're courageous for going through this. This is just life, you know? I, I'm no more courageous than anybody just living. This is what I get. This is the hand I've gotten. So I, I don't know that I have words of wisdom specifically, but I do know how to be there for somebody right. now when they are going through something. And a lot of us will go through this and I'm, I'm so much richer of a human being for having gone through this and going through it right now that I feel that I can be there for other people better. And that's what I can offer. Maybe not, <laughs> maybe not wisdom, but humanness and support in a way that's meaningful. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yes. So, so what's, what's next on the horizon for Ms. Tanya Kay? <laughs> Well, uh, two and a half years ago, I started the immigration process to Canada. Oh, okay. And oh, wow. Not, I got land. Oh, to go to <laughs> you what? Did you I say? I want to go to Canada. <laughs> I want to go to Canada. I want to go to Canada. I do want to go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we got uh, landing papers, ironically, when quarantine started. Oh, wow. Uh, so I, uh, what's on the horizon is me uh, actually seeing through my landing up there mm -hmm. and uh, eventually getting dual citizenship and being able to live and work in both countries equally. Oh. Um, so cool. I'm excited about that. That's what I've got, you know, in front of me looking forward to uh, right now. What's on the horizon is continually focused. I'm, my priority is healing cancer right, right. now. Mm -hmm. So um, that is on my horizon, moving to Canada, uh, completing that process, continuing that process. And Can vegans eat poutine? Yeah. There's poutine. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, There's so. half a block from my front door is a pretty heavy vegan poutine maker. Oh. Hi. I mean, as soon as you said Canada, it's the first thing that popped in my head was I want some poutine now. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. I mean, That's not so good. Tanya, that is, that is fantastic. I mean, I, I know that the, the articles on racingjunk.com are absolutely fantastic. I'm looking forward to more stuff there. I'm looking forward to, you know, your, your performances in the future. I know you got acting gigs lined up as well. Looking forward to those. Um, you know, is there anything else? that, uh, you know, do you want to throw out there? Maybe how, how can people find you? What else you got coming up on the horizon, that type of stuff? 
Oh yeah. Um, so uh, I'm currently a film that I have a supporting lead in called The Pom Pom Murders is on Lifetime right now. So just keep checking that schedule if you want to see me acting on Lifetime. Love it. You're the I coach do, in that, that one. That sounds cool. Coach. Yeah. It's good. I like it. I've done a lot of Lifetime movies and I like this one. There's real dancing in it. Good dancers, by the way. And uh, it sounds like it's a murder mystery, which is right up my alley. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> and and being someone who announces on the national cheerleading circuit, you know, that's you know yeah. watching oh, people get murdered. That's hey. true, you do. You yep. do. <laughs> yep. I also just shot a co star on Animal Kingdom. So yes. they're Woo. trying to come back from lockdown and do things safely and they did a great job on set, I, I have to admit it. Mm -hmm. And uh and so they'll be releasing their fifth season soon, and I'll be in 506, so the sixth episode in the fifth season. Nice. Animal Kingdom. Yeah, and my film band that I directed and danced in this summer is uh, at festivals right now. I also directed and acted in another quarantine film this summer called Every Digital Ghost. It's completely different. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a thriller. That's so, cool. Totally different than bands, but that's coming out. And uh, I'm going to be doing some more photo shoots here soon because that can be done safely in Los Angeles. You sure. Don't have, you don't have to yeah. get too close to people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Anita Berber is Dead is a full length uh, dark musical comedy that I created with the Independent Shakespeare Company last year. And because of the quarantine, we are using our creativity to solve these problems. It was supposed to premiere. Um, we workshop production that last year it was a, a success, a wild success. It was supposed to premiere this fall. So instead, we're adapting it into a screenplay. Oh, cool. We might have an opportunity to shoot it before we have an opportunity to perform it live again. Uh, also, um, Keep in touch because Pinup Pole Show is always going to be up to something, and we will be doing virtual performances and photo shoots, and and hopefully coming back to perform for you live very soon. Well, everybody who knows RacingJunk.com knows Tanya K's Pinup Pole Show, so I know they are excited to hear about oh, that. Good, 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 good. Yeah, Let me tell you, you what, me on on the internet, just uh, go to social media, <laughs> right. Know place <laughs> she's all over the place she's got everything well tanya k let me tell you this has been an absolute joy and you are a treasure so thank you so much for spending time with us today this has been just a ton of fun uh once again it is tanya k i the, let me tell you what brutally elegant actress i love yeah. that line described you perfectly the most dangerous woman in hollywood actress filmmaker dancer performer writer everything carb club pinup just extraordinary esquire Alan Esquire. <laughs> yes, Esquire. <laughs> That's just, and then soon to be Canadian. Tanya, thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to catch up with you here again shortly. And good luck with the, everything going on too with the, with the treatments and the processes. I know that's going to go well for you. And I can't wait to see where you land, man. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be, me to be on the show. Hey, it's Arna. Thanks we look forward to talking Tanya. to you soon. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. See Bye. you, Tanya. Bye-bye. <laughs> Wow. And, and she's out there in the thick of things in LA too. So yeah. uh, Tanya, thank you so much once again for taking the time to join us. What a, just a great story. And you know, I, Ellen, I didn't really want to jump on it as much when she was talking about how, when she was younger, she got arrested so many times. Um, <laughs> but that's a challenge in and of itself to overcome. Yeah, it is. I mean, especially if you want to have you know, you gotta. She talks about the social media presence and having to look a certain way, and it feels like that's all our country wants to focus on these days is looking a certain way right. or acting a certain way. Um, but the fact is, let's just face it, people. Let's be real. Let me. I want one person to speak up on this, a comment on this. If you're perfect, I want to hear from you, and then let's talk about your real life. Oh yeah. There ain't one of y'all out here listening. I love you to death. None of y'all is perfect. Nobody's perfect. And, and the fact is, we need to support each other for our struggles because the truth is, we all struggle with something. We all struggle through something. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're all struggling through something together now. So you can't hide from that. So let's just be real here. 
we've all gone through adversity. We've all, you know, how many how many people have had some brush up with the law growing up? Honestly, I didn't get arrested, but I came down near close to it three times. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked my way out of it. I don't know how. That's that's why I've had to change identities about twelve times. <laughs> I know. So let's just be real here. We all have a past. So um, the fact <sighs> is, is she's overcome that past and she's doing something incredible with it. And I feel like those past experiences make us the person we are. So if we hide from them, we'll never be the cool, fantastic people we are. I mean, she has an edge to her because of what what she went, you know, she's going through that. Yeah. And I love that because I've always wanted to meet somebody who has an artsy edge. Like I've kind of hidden from a lot of people for Mm -hmm. too long because that's why I don't fit in the professional world. Sure. (laughs) I've tried talked about getting fired from you know factory jobs i feel like i've kind of been let go from corporate world because i never fit in i'm too artsy <laughs> yeah sure oh yeah no and you know and that's the thing you, i mean you you can tell not only did she have just talent off the charts um i mean just you know everything there's probably stuff that she didn't even tell us about that you know she's extremely proficient at um mm-hmm. But she's she's comfortable where she's at because she's comfortable with the experiences and where it's brought her. And that's huge for being able to tap into your own potential uh, and, and excel at things. So, um, you, you know, and you're absolutely right. I'm not very comfortable in the corporate scene anymore. I, I hated wearing the suits. That's just not me. Well, no. um, I mean, you know, we, we used to talk about that back in the old corporate days. Uh, it's, it's just not it's just not me. It's too fake. And I'm, I'm not a fan of the, uh, the, the, you know, the corporate plug words that you hear people using all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's the paradigm shift and you know, it's, it's forward innovative thinking. That's going to, you know, it's like, just stop, <laughs> just be real with me. Um, <laughs> you know, which, which I think is why I love where I'm at right you know now, because we're just so mm-hmm. real and the management we have is just, they're, they're real people and they feel like real people. Uh, and Tanya K was definitely, Real a people. real person. Yeah, she is real. That. Yep. And real good people too. I am so proud of what she's doing, what she's able to accomplish. But more importantly than that, I'm proud that you were able to get her, Ellen. Another one, man. Another one. Great job. Hey, hey. like I said, all my editors doing. <laughs> you know, it almost makes up for all the bandwagon jumping that you do <laughs> with your football, with football teams. I mean, you know, so. Maybe I'm just really a two player fan. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. Well, I do know this. Uh, we have a lot more coming here on Behind the Wheel yeah. at RacingJunk.com. And if Ellen reaches out to you, please respond to her because you don't want me getting sicked on you. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I got a, I got a big swick, a, a big stick to swing nowadays, and you know, I'd, I'd hate to swing it. <laughs> and we also just want to give a shout out to all those who, you know, Tanya talked a little bit about her uh, battle against breast cancer breast cancer well I can't talk today so I just a big shout out to all those who are battling this kind of um, you know disease and, and things like that because the fact is is that's going to make you an overcomer and I want to hear yep. your story so if there are more of you out there like Tanya who are afraid to tell your story don't be afraid yeah there are more people that need to hear your story than you could possibly realize yeah. So let's come out, out from underneath the word work. We salute you. We want to tell your story. And we wish all of you a speedy recovery. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, just kind of like what Tanya said, too, you know, you don't have to worry about providing words of wisdom. Uh, sometimes just being there is more than exactly. enough. So, exactly. So thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Behind the Wheel on RacingJunk.com. Uh, for Lil E, Ellen Richardson, I'm Chris Young. We look forward to catching you next time. Be safe. Have fun. We'll see you soon.